Hi, I'm Malcolm Torres, the host of the Sea Stories and Science Fiction Podcast. Thanks for joining me. Today, I've got a salty old story called Mother Carries Chickens. And it's about this woman, beautiful young woman, who survives a shipwreck on a remote British island. And for decades, she haunts the stormy crags above the sea, talking to the birds. And she becomes part of the folklore and a bit of a mystery. And she talks to the birds and the seabirds fly out and they fly around the ships that come near the island and the sailors being superstitious begin to think that the birds have some kind of magical power to keep them safe because the lady who survived the shipwreck many years ago is up in the cliffs talking to them so it's this kooky kind of superstitious fun salty old story i hope you enjoy it uh, leave me a like and a comment and uh, subscribe thank you for joining me all right welcome to the sea stories and science fiction podcast everybody take your seats stow your gear let's get ready to shove off the title of today's story is mother carries chickens a legend of the silly isles the silly isles is the name given to the group of islands situated on the english coast at a distance of about 30 miles west of Land's End, on the coast of Cornwall. They may be seen from this point in clear weather, like broken cliffs rising out of the Atlantic. These islands cover an area of about 40 miles in circumference, and being in the direct track of vessels bound to the English Channel, present a formidable impediment to the safe navigation of these seas and are frequently the scenes of disasters and fatal shipwrecks. Many merchant ships have been lost upon these rocks with all their crews, and the fatal shipwrecks of the British ships of the line and other ships of the fleet, resulting in the death of many brave officers and men, are recorded in the naval annals of Great Britain. Some of these islands are nothing more than high and craggy rocks, elevating their heads above the ocean, Six of them, however, are of considerable size, mostly covered with soil and inhabited. Their names are St. Mary, Trescaw, St. Martin, St. Agnes, on which the lighthouse is erected, Samson, and Brehar. The largest of these islands is St. Mary's, which is about 10 miles in circumference, and a considerable portion of it is susceptible of cultivation. The inhabitants are industrious, hardy people, engaged principally in the occupation of fishing and husbandry. The little island of Brehar lies on the southwestern side of the cluster and now contains upwards of 100 inhabitants. It possesses but little soil capable of culture. Its surface is uneven, and some of the hills are high and rugged. More than 125 years have passed away since an event occurred which created quite a sensation among the people of the Silly Isles, and is still talked of among the aged inhabitants of Brehar, which island was the theater of the scene I am about to relate. It was a gloomy night. The wind blew in fearful gusts from the southwest, the rain fell in torrents, and the waves dashed with a loud and angry roar against the naked rocks. The fishing boats were safely moored in the little bay, or drawn up on the shore, and the good women and children who dwelt on the rough and barren island of Brehar, while they listened to the raging of the furious storm, devoutly thanked their God that their husbands, their parents, and their brethren were not exposed in their frail boats to the terrible hurricane. God help the poor sailor now, exclaimed a worthy dame, as she heaped some fragment of an old wreck upon the fire. For the month was October, and the weather was unpleasantly chill. Amen, exclaimed her hard-featured husband, who had thrown himself on the low bed in a corner of the room. I hope no vessel will be driven among the rocks on such a terrible night as this, for although a wreck would be a godsend to us, it would be certain death to all the poor fellows on board. Hark! I thought I heard a gun. It was only the scream of the wind. It was no alarm. It was the sound of the wind and the waves. It was a gun. I know the sound too well to be mistaken, said the fisherman, as he threw on his outer garments and prepared to leave his hut, ascend the crag, and brave the fury of the blast. 
And there is another alarmingly near. Some vessel is driven by the tempest upon these rocks. Good woman, rouse out the boys. I will summon our neighbors, but I am afraid it will be to no purpose. What madness to venture so near the silly islands on such a night as this. In a few minutes there stood on the edge of a cliff, peering anxiously out upon the murky waters, regardless of the rain or the wind or the sea-salt spray, which, when a wave broke beneath their feet, fell over them in drenching showers, a little band of men, with weather-beaten features, but athletic figures and warm hearts. They feared not the storm. Its howling was music to their ears, to which they had been accustomed from infancy. But an alarm had been given, and a mingled feeling of curiosity and humanity, and perhaps a secret, unacknowledged sense of pleasure at the prospect of a profitable wreck, urged these rude and uncultivated men to mount the summit of the cliff amid the darkness of the night and the conflict of the elements. Another gun was distinctly heard. The vessel, urged by the violence of the tempest, was rapidly approaching. The crew were doubtless aware of their danger and sent forth the well-known summons for assistance, but no earthly power could save them from shipwreck. Earnestly, but in vain, the fishermen strove to penetrate the darkness, which seemed a black curtain drawn around them, shutting out all objects from their view. Nothing could be seen, but their imaginations could picture a scene of terror. Through fancy's magic glass, they witnessed struggles for life, convulsive wrestlings with the water, and death in a fearful shape. And these visions, which their reason told them would soon be realized, caused their bosoms to thrill with emotion. Poor fellows, it will soon be all over with them, exclaimed in sorrowful accents a venerable looking fisherman, and at the moment, as if to establish the truth of his opinion, loud and prolonged shrieks reached their ears as of beings in mortal agony. There, cried the fisherman, the ship is among the breakers. She is on the rocks. Let us hasten to assist the crew, if it is not too late. And these bold men descended to the craggy and surf-worn rocks, with a view to aid any of the unfortunate crew who might be swept upon the shore, and also to save such portions of the wreck as the waves might throw upon the rocks. By the light of lanterns, which were procured from their cottages, they narrowly examined the surface of the waters and the crests of the foaming breakers, and it was not long ere they descried, borne toward them on the heaving billows, broken spars, deal boards, pieces of railings, and other materials, showing that beyond a doubt some vessel had struck upon the ledge within hail of the spot where they stood and had been dashed to pieces. At length their attention was attracted by a large plank, to which, as if it was lifted high on the top of a foaming billow, appeared to be attached some object resembling a human being. It was soon thrown upon the rocks and was eagerly seized upon by the fishermen and borne high upon the cliffs beyond the reach of the waves it was then found that the body of a woman was lashed firmly to the plank. The unfortunate being was insensible, but she was with care conveyed to the nearest cottage, and means were adopted for restoring her senses. For a long time these efforts were unsuccessful, and it was thought her soul had taken flight to another world. It was not so. She was preserved to linger yet for many years on the stage of life, and act an humble part in the great drama of existence. But she suffered much agony before she was restored to consciousness, and many hours elapsed ere she was able to hold converse with anyone and enlighten her kind preservers of the subject of the melancholy event which had taken place. In the meantime, the fishermen continued their labors on the shore, and the dawn of day found them still busily employed in hauling up pieces of the wreck and bales, boxes, barrels, and packages, which had drifted on shore. The bodies of two men were also washed ashore, terribly bruised by being dashed upon the rocks, but life was extinct. As daylight opened upon them, 
a part of the hull of a large vessel could be seen at not more than a couple of cables length distance lodged upon a reef of rocks and buried ever and anon by the breakers a portion of the hull and all the spars and the greater portion of the cargo had been forced by the wind and waves upon the iron-bound shores of the island but all the crew of that ill-fated ship and all the passengers save that one poor female lashed to a plank had been hurried into eternity they had been called suddenly and unexpectedly while perhaps the ties which attached them to life were strong and numerous to account for their conduct at the bar of their god the woman who had been saved from death on returning to consciousness and on hearing that all her companions in that devoted bark were drowned seemed overwhelmed with the bitterness of woe the empire of reason appeared to be overthrown and in the midst of her outbreaks of grief she often spoke of her husband and child her destitute lonely and mournful fate was deeply pitied by the rough but honest inhabitants of that sterile island who were unremitting in their efforts to soothe her sorrows and alleviate her woes it subsequently appeared that the vessel which had been lost was the large ship james moffat which a week previous had sailed from the port of bristol for philadelphia with a cargo of provisions clothing and goods of various kinds for the colonies among the passengers was a gentleman with his wife and child his wife was a beautiful woman about twenty-two years of age possessed of every grace and accomplishment and it appeared that when the storm which we have described was at its height and when the dreadful roar of breakers was heard under the lee a sound of fearful import in the ears of seamen in that awful moment the husband and father with his own hands attached his living treasures to a plank which he hoped would be the means of rescuing them from death the child was washed from the plank by the forces of the waves but the mother as i have already related reached the shore and was secure by the kind-hearted fisherman some days elapsed ere she was able to give away the particulars of the disaster during which time her life was in imminent danger and when she was so far recovered that she could understand the questions put to her her replies were reluctantly given and unsatisfactory she would furnish no information respecting the place of her home or whether she was going to or returning from the land of her nativity she merely said that her name was carrie and whether she had near connections or friends residing in europe or america no one could tell it was evident that all her hopes and her joys were buried beneath the waters with her husband and child a dark and impassable barrier seemed to be raised between her and the rest of the world and she looked forward to death as to a friend that would pave the way for a reunion with those who she loved some weeks passed away and her physical strength was in a great measure restored but she evinced no desire to quit the island on the contrary when the subject was mentioned that she was told that means would be provided if she wished to carry her to st mary's and thence back to bristol she exhibited dissatisfaction and alarm oh do not she said tear me from this sacred spot where i can behold the turbulent waves as they roll over the bodies of my husband and child pray let me remain here i promise you i will not trouble you nor do i wish to eat the bread of idleness i will work i will assist your wives in their household duties i will nurse you in sickness and i will be a friend and a mother to your children and instruct them in the paths of learning and in their duties to their god i will willingly submit to any privation or hardship only do not i pray you insist on my leaving this island it was evident that misfortune had affected her reason her words and manner excited the pity of those whom she addressed and they assured her that her presence was by no means unwelcome that they would be pleased to have her remain among them as long as she chose and would never mention the subject of her departure again as it appeared to give her pain the subject was never again referred to mrs carey remained upon the island and for many years was an object of compassion of admiration of respect or fear to the inhabitants she was what is termed a beautiful woman 
Her features were regular, and her figure was tall and majestic, yet of graceful proportions. But her countenance during life was never known to be lighted up with a smile after the death of her husband and child. Her features became pale, rigid, and resembled the chiseling of a marbled statue. Her words were few, for although never reluctant to impart instruction or give advice when it could be of service, she abstained from all unnecessary conversation and studiously avoided the subject of her former home or connections. In the dead of night, when the inmates of the humble huts were wrapped in sleep, she would wander about the cliffs or seat herself upon the extreme verge of a precipice and pass hours in gazing into the depths below and indulging in gloomy reflections. And when a fierce storm arose and the winds howled and the rains fell and the thunder rolled over her head and the lightning hissed and the waves dashed madly against the rocks, she would ascend some lofty crag and stand there for hours looking like the spirit of the storm and gazing abroad into the troubled waters, seeming to enjoy the conflict of the warring elements. On the little promontory on the southwestern part of the island of Brehar were some ruins of an ancient building believed to be a temple built of stone by the Druids many years ago. This was a bleak and desolate spot at a distance from any habitation and exposed to all the fury of the winds and the inclemency of the weather. This spot commanded a full view of the ledge of rocks on which the ship James Moffat had struck on that fateful night, and it was a favorite resort for the Widow Carey, by which appellation the unfortunate woman was now generally known. And here, at her request, a habitation was prepared for her among these ancient ruins, a place well suited to the gloomy tone of her mind. And here, upon this promontory, was her home, and in this dwelling and upon the adjacent cliff she passed most of her hours alone. Her form could often be witnessed moving about among the crags when the fishermen departed from the shores as the day was breaking in the east, and on their return at evening twilight her loose garments would be seen floating in the air from the summit of a high rock. And it is not surprising that those ignorant and superstitious people were led gradually to regard her with a feeling of awe and to believe that she possessed a power which was seldom confided to mortal hands. It was usual, when a party was about to embark on a distant and adventurous expedition, first to proceed to the residence of the widow Carey and ask her blessings on the voyage, and when they returned in safety from a successful expedition, they would smile and wave their hands as they passed the headland on which was her wild abode. The little petrel birds, which at certain seasons were seen in great numbers around the Scilly Islands, seemed to be to her an object of great interest. She appeared to have entertained the idea that these birds possessed a mysterious nature, that they were indeed the bodies in another form which enshrined the spirits of those unfortunate beings who had perished by shipwreck or other disasters at sea. She loved to watch their graceful motions as they flew over the waters, and to listen to their shrill cries even in the midnight hour, which, it was believed, predicted an approaching tempest. She would sit on a rock and talk to these stormy petrels for hours, and often occupied herself in supplying them with food suitable to their wants. It is not, therefore, remarkable that these strange birds love to frequent the waters that wash that part of the island, and might be seen at almost any hour in large numbers flying backwards and forwards near the shore and hovering around or apparently resting upon the waters which bathe the widow Carey's promontory. The inhabitants believed that she held converse with these birds, that they understood her language and replied in a language of their own, intelligible only to herself, and henceforward it was considered not only an act of wanton cruelty, but wicked and unwise to kill or injure one of those inoffensive petrels who seemed to be objects of so much interest and care to the unfortunate woman that they received the name of the widow Carey's chickens. Many years passed away, and another generation came upon the stage. The widow Carey still lived. She was unchanged in character and habits. 
Still, she made her home within the ruins of the ancient Druidical temple. She still wandered at midnight in the midst of storms and exposed to the rigors of the wintry blast among the rocks and cliffs which overhung the raging sea. She still shrank from any intercourse with the inhabitants of the island and cherished her attachment to the stormy petrels. She was an object of wonder and admiration to the children who gazed, not without some sensation of fear, upon her gaunt figure, now bowed by age and sorrow, upon her withered cheeks, and upon her gray eye, lighted up by the fires of insanity, and the words, Mother Carrie, were often quoted by weak parents as a bugbear to frighten delinquent children into the fulfillment of their duties. But she was never known to do harm to anyone. On the contrary, she had given many proofs of a kind and benevolent disposition, and was regarded by the older inhabitants of the island with a considerable degree of affection mingled with awe. Indeed, she was always treated with kindness by all the inhabitants of the island, but this might be attributed in some degree to fear as well as to affection. She was supplied by the fishermen with all the necessaries of life. In the winter of her life, when she had passed at least three score years on the island and her pilgrimage was drawing to a close, she talked more frequently to herself than formerly and was often heard to utter in an impassioned tone names of persons which had never before been heard by the inhabitants. She was often evidently wandering in other lands among other people and witnessing other and dearer scenes, but no clue was ever given to her real name, her family, or even her country. One cold and dismal morning in the month of March, as Abel Millar, a worthy and venerable fisherman, who well recollected the time when the wreck of the James Moffat took place, and the widow Carey was cast upon those shores, with his two sons, was passing the promontory on his boat, on his course to the outer fishing grounds. He saw that extraordinary female, apparently seated in a reclining position on the summit of the crag, a favorite resort with her, which was nearest to and overlooked the ledge upon which the fatal shipwreck took place. This circumstance, however, elicited no surprise, as it was by no means an uncommon occurrence. But when, as the sun sank beneath the horizon and the shades of night began to fall, Abel returned from his expedition and saw that she was still on the same spot and that her position appeared unchanged. He became somewhat alarmed, and after his boat was secured, accompanied by his sons and some neighbors, hastened to that barren spot of the island which was regarded as the domain of the widow, or as she was now generally called, Mother Carey. But this singular and unfortunate woman had reached the goal of her sorrows at last. Her spirit had shaken off its earthly tenement and had ascended to another and better world. A smile remained upon her features in death, an indication of happiness which had never been witnessed by the inhabitants of the island during her life. It seemed as if she had died, rejoicing at the prospect of meeting those in the realms of bliss, whose fate she had constantly mourned for threescore years. Her withered and fleshless hand grasped a miniature richly set in gold, which was attached to her neck by a golden chain. It was a portrait of an elegant-looking man in the morning of life, in the fullness of health, and with a countenance beaming with hope and with joy, undoubtedly the likeness of her husband, to whom she was attached by ties which time or sorrows could not destroy or weaken. But the contrast presented to the view of the fisherman between the appearance of the two individuals was a painful one. The woman lay before them bearing upon her countenance all the marks of extreme age, the thin and snow-white hair, the sunken cheeks, the wrinkled forehead, and the attenuated form, and there in her hand was the counterfeit presentment of the man who, arrayed in all the attractions of youth and beauty, won her maiden affections and led her to the nuptial altar. Such was the contrast which had been wrought by the hand of time, and which produced deep and unpleasant emotions in the bosom of the bystanders. Such, say the legend, was the fate of Mother Carey, and her name is still remembered by the aged Tritons, 
who inhabit the wild and sterile spot known as the island of Brehar, and the remains of the temple of the Druids are still pointed out as the habitation of that weird woman. The stormy petrels continued for a time to visit the islands and to gather in flocks around the high and bleak promontory, but their friend, their guardian, was gone. There was no one to pamper them now, to watch their circling flights, and to hold converse with them in a language with which they seemed pleased. Even if it could not be understood, and the fishermen thought, it might be fancy, that the sounds which they uttered were more plaintive than before, as if they felt and deplored the loss of their benefactor. But even after death she exercised over these mysterious birds a kind of protective influence, and not only the fishermen of the Scilly Isles, but the mariner on the broad blue ocean even now views with a kind of holy horror any wanton attempts to destroy or injure the inoffensive and social but incomprehensible Mother Carey's chickens. And there you have it, shipmates. Mother Carey's chickens. A famous old story that's been told and retold by sailors for hundreds of years. This story is from an old, old book that I found in a bookshop in Northampton on Long Island in New York. I was browsing the bookshop as I do, looking for old sea stories and science fiction books. And I found this book. It's titled Ocean Adventures. And this story is from that book. It was published in the 1850s in Boston by a man named John Sherburn Sleeper. And thank you, folks, for joining me. And I look forward to meeting up with you online. I'm on Instagram and Twitter, Facebook, Goodreads, LinkedIn. I have a YouTube channel. So I hope you've enjoyed this story. I certainly have. Until next time, fair winds and following seas. Thank mm-hmm. you.